Hello, welcome ladies and gentlemen to the Indie Lounge. This is Carlos Phoenix, and today I have a very special guest. His name is Robert Rose. He is a person that's traveling all over the world <coughs> and building a TV show about travel. Um, and I'm going to have you explain it a little <coughs> bit better than I can, if you, if you don't mind. Cause I'll, I'll try. I, I tend to destroy things, so, um, <laughs> so feel free. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, honestly, when we first started, it, that is, it was pretty much that basic, man. It was about travel. But I think we always had a vision in our mind uh, of where we were headed. And we're not there yet, but uh, basically Raw Travel is a show that um, focuses on off-the-beaten-path travel, really independent DIY kind of travel uh, that's not definitely not luxury travel. It's, there's nothing against luxury travel or group travel, but it's really about being an independent person um, you know, maybe you and some friends going uh, to off the beaten path locations like Colombia, South America, and just having authentic cultural experiences, which is really what's missing, I think, for most travel shows. And uh, we focus on ecotourism, volunteerism, underground culture, and really authenticity is the key word. That's what we really focus on. You know, um, I've been able to see some snippets of, uh, of the show and... Um, I just recently got back from South America, Colombia, and uh, you go to places that I probably wouldn't even dare to go, or, or you know, because sometimes as a when you go as a tourist. Now I'm, I'm my parents are from there, but when I go, you know, all the people tell you where to go that's safe, right? And uh, and they have a certain perception of their own area of where to go, um, but you seem to go to like the the more the real deal. Um, is, is, I guess, the best words I can put it in. Um, you go into the, the neighborhoods where you're really going to get the thickness of the culture. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'll be honest with you. When I lived in the U.S., I had a lot of friends that were Colombian, and some of them outright told me not to go. Uh, I went to places that Colombians themselves, living in the U.S., had not gone to. And um, the reality is what happens is, and I don't recommend this for everybody, we're not taking risks for risk's sake. Um, you know, we're not trying to see how edgy or funky or life-threatening we can be. I like life. I'd like to continue to live. I don't like getting robbed. I have been robbed. It's not fun. Um, but at the same time, what happens is once you get to a location, you sort of get to separate the hype from everything, and you sort of get a, a real comfort level about where you can and can't go. And what happens is your, your instincts kick in, and you should always listen to people when they give you a warning especially when you hear repeated warnings. Um, you know, more than one person telling you something, there's probably a good reason for that. However, ask more than one person because if you ask 10 people, you may get 10 different answers. And proceed with caution. Um, and if you do go to a place uh, like that I have been, uh, take the necessary precautions that they tell you to take. Uh, we went to one place in Medellin that was uh, really up in the mountains, it was as high as you could go. And the police don't even go there. And uh, But I went with World Vision. I didn't just go up there on my own. Like, oh, let me just go up here with this gang-infested territory. We went with World Vision. We had World Vision shirts. We had World Vision uh, on the taxi. And we had permission before we went in. And we knew that we had to be out by a certain time. And um, I wanted to do it. And it wasn't like the Wild Wild West. Uh, I've done favela tours in Brazil as well. It's not the wild, wild west like you think. It actually is pretty organized. It's just, um, unfortunately, the government is unable or unwilling to take care of places like people in places like that. So it's sort of like they create their own system, and for better or for worse, uh, that you know that they're they're the ones res you know responsible for law and order in those places. And uh, it's it's an eye opening experience to go there. And uh, you know you always want to get the real essence of the place. And I think in order to do that, you have to get outside of the tourist bubble. But First time to a place, I'm all about the tourist bubble. You got to go there, get your feet wet, get your get your knees sort of like, okay, I got my legs up under me. Now maybe I'll just venture out into some of these other areas. Yeah, that, that, so that's true. Um, we went to areas that, of course, uh, you want to meet, you want to see because especially if it's the first few times you go there, it's the places that everybody's telling you to go. Uh, good leather, good jewelry, good this, good that. Um, and, and if anything's good, the food. The food is fantastic over there. Right. Um, right. In fact, uh, months before we even went to the trip, we planned where we wanted to go eat. So right. um, 
but what's what's cool or what's interesting is, uh, especially in South America or in, in Colombia in particular, uh, they're going through. They just finished a phase of where uh, what people recognize as the cartel and all these uh, violent areas and territories and kidnappings and so on. And um, and in some areas that that's kind of like the past now. And so I remember traveling and seeing that uh, the, the the folks that live there are pointing out where the cartel used to live. And everybody seemed to know, but they never told the police because, of course, of fear and so on. Right. But um, but did you go through any of those type of areas? Did you say, did you go into areas that maybe they're still around? Yeah, I mean, well, when we originally, we went to the Amazon uh, in Leticia uh, in Colombia, which is where Brazil, Peru... And Colombia all come together. They're called Tres Fronteras, three three borders. And originally, we were going to go through an area. I can't remember. I have my map on the wall. What it was called, um, but it was uh, away from there. And we have been warned, forewarned, not to go. Mainly because of me. My crew could have gone because they're Colombian Americans. But me being a non Latino, sticking quite out with my blonde hair, my I really can't. In this case camouflage myself in some places I can maybe like in Argentina or, or in Ukraine um, I could pass before they speak to me but in Colombia you know I would be a target especially if we had cameras and so you know we just said hey man let's don't go there let's go to Leticia there's a you know go you know don't let it change your plans dramatically we still went to the Amazon we just went to a different area of the Amazon uh, that's one instance. I did go to Popayan for a wedding, which Popayan is right outside of Cali. And I have a good friend who's uh, from there. And Popayan is beautiful and it's safe. But right outside of Popayan, you could still, there had um, there were some guards where a bridge had just been blown up, uh, I, best, I guess by the guerrillas. And so they had to build a road around it. And you just don't see that kind of stuff in Medellin or Bogota or Cartagena or even in Cali. Uh, but I saw it, you know, out, on the outskirts, on the way from Cali to Popayan. And it gave me pause. And I can almost feel a little bit more tenseness down there. And it, it's you, you learn, as I said, to depend on your instincts more and to trust your instincts more. So, sometimes they're wrong, but they're right a lot of the time. And, and I could just feel the tenseness. And uh, it wasn't imaginary. Yeah. Uh, even yeah. sometimes uh, when you're in areas where you just see the police over there, they're, right. they're dressed up in a very different type of uniform than you know American uh, officers. And sometimes right. they're carrying military style weapons so um it is intimidating so um you went into brazil uh, not brazil well I, brazil the amazons yeah um was there a particular focus that you were going up for there well with the amazon it's such um man it was, it was amazing we were only there three days and um i've had the chance to go back and i, I unfortunately was not able to take advantage uh, but i do want to go back because i'll tell you what it, it's rough the way we did it was rough. We wanted to really just go see the Amazon, see if we can get in touch with some indigenous culture. Uh, we didn't go that deep into it. Um, we hiked like three hours. We took a boat, of course, four hours upriver from Leticia and, and then took hike for three hours. Uh, but it wasn't that deep because once we got to the location where there was this indigenous village, first of all, they were dressed like a lot of them wearing T-shirts like myself. And second of all, the, the first thing we saw was a guy putting up a satellite dish. So we were like, well, so much for the thatched huts and all that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> and thank God for that guy, by the way, because we had drank all our water, eaten all our food, and we were, like, exhausted and whining like uh, city slickers that we were. Like, oh, my God, we can't make it back. And he's and my guide is like, we got to turn around and go back because we don't want to be caught in the Amazon at night. And we're like, how are we going to do it? We caught a ride back with the satellite dish installer. So it was wow. our lucky, you know, day that the guy <laughs> was there, people, you know, so put up the satellite dish. Give you a ride. Yeah, he gave us a ride, man. It was cool. Yeah, he gave us a boat ride. And, oh, man, trust me, I slept like a baby. But the Amazon itself, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is beautiful. And, of course, and it goes without saying, and I should have expected this, but there's animals everywhere, man. And they're, they're wild. And so, like, we had a wild little baby owl staying in our hut. And he wasn't like a pet. He was just, like, <laughs> hanging out. And they're not afraid of humans as much. Uh, I guess they're not because they're used to them, but because you, like you're in their domain. So there would be parrots and monkeys and um, um, parakeets. You know, the dogs eat bananas and their ducks. And they, I felt like Doctor Doolittle. 
They were just all the animals were there getting along. If you're hanging out, here comes a monkey over here, a parakeet over here, uh, a duck come up here, and then like a, a little snake will slither by, and it, it feels it now, feels really cool. Insects? I mean, is is that a big deal over there? What's that? What about insects? Is that like you know mosquitoes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you, you sleep in the mosquito nets. Um, we only had electricity for during the day, basically. So at night, the fan turns off, mm. and you just hear nothing but jungle and it's complete darkness uh, because it's just you're oh I mean it's, and then when it rains it's just you hear the leaves I mean it's hard to describe you have to really go and even in the show we can't describe it and do it justice you have to go personally to see it because there's not many chances I grew up on a farm in Tennessee so I know I you know I grew up around nature and I was completely in awe and I'm still in awe and the one thing you need to remember in the Amazon a lot of ways to die so, you know, there's like, when we're doing our hike, they're like, don't touch anything. Don't do this. Don't do that. And if you see that, don't do that. And I'm like, I'm just not going to touch anything ever. And, you know, because basically if you get bit by a snake or if you get, you know, some poison, you know, up against, you lean up against a tree that's got poison, you know, there's not doctors just, you know, there's not a real hospitals close by. Right. And, um, you know, it might be why the median age I think is, like they live to be in their fifties. The for men it's like fifty five. Hmm. So I'm like, damn, I, I would be dead soon, you know, if I lived in the Amazon, you know. So um one of the things I like about the show, um, granted I haven't seen a full episode yet, but um on some of the uh episodes you put like travel tips. Right. So um in fact what I'd like to do is just put on a clip right now of one of the travel tips. Okay. And uh let's take a look. Money. Try traveling without it, and it's going to be a long trip. But luckily, thanks to ATMs, you can pretty much get cash almost anywhere you travel these days. Here are some money tips to try before your big trip. First, call your bank and let them know when and where you're going to be traveling, and make sure that you'll have access to your money at your destination. Secondly, bring enough cash for the first couple of days. I like to wait until I get to a destination before I exchange currency. That way I get a better rate. But if you're a little nervous, go ahead and do it. Get a couple days worth of currency and you'll feel better about things when you get there. And then thirdly, always bring a little stash of emergency cash and put it away somewhere safely. You never know what might happen and chances are you're not going to need it, but it's always good to know it's there. For more tips on money and traveling, visit the tips section on our website at rawtravel.tv. So that was a tip about um, calling your bank and that type of stuff. That was very cool. Now, um, so one of the main reasons we have you on the show today is, is not so much about the show because you guys, if in certain cities, uh, you'll be able to see the show. Um, what I would like to get into is the fact that you're independent. This is not something that's being done um, by a major network. This is you. Right. Totally raw, totally traveling. Uh, mm-hmm. Hence, raw travel. But you, you know, you're you're supporting it yourself, and you're out there now shopping it to different networks and stuff. So let's get a little bit into that conversation and the experiences that you're going through with that. Yeah, I mean, I have, I am not a producer by trade. I guess um, I started off in advertising sales, which has helped me immensely because it's allowed me to be independent. But I used to produce uh, a show targeted to the Latin market because I worked for Spanish language TV and I thought I got this, you know, idea. It wasn't my idea. There are many ideas. People have many ideas to produce shows in English for the Latin market. And I, I looked at the research and it was overwhelming. I was like, my God, we have to do this. So took a pilot and, you know, shopped it around to networks and nobody got it. You know, even with all my salesmanship, selling programming is very different from selling advertising. People who make programming decisions are good people, but they tend to sometimes feel like they're the arbiters of what is good or bad. And for good reason, their jobs depend on it. However, the thing is, nobody, nobody knows anything. And that's evident by watching television. You can see the garbage that's on there. As a matter of fact, my friends are always like, man, I can't believe you can't get your show picked up by a network. That's nothing but garbage on there. And I'm like, I know. And I'm like, you know, it is embarrassing to a degree. 
But um, I, I basically had the same experience with the Latin show I had with the travel show, which is, you know, people sort of got it. They didn't really weren't that enthusiastic about it. So I, I, what I did is I just went and I, what I did is what is called broadcast syndication. That's where you go market by market. And it's a very tough, brutal business. It's an old business model, but it's basically you go city to city and you get a local affiliate to give you a time slot to air your half hour or hour show. And they don't pay you any money. You're providing them a free program. They give you a time slot and you split the advertising time. And so they sell their time, their three and a half minutes or whatever to the local advertisers. And the producer sells their three and a half minutes to the national advertisers who will buy all of the markets that you can get. So the more markets you get, the higher you can sell your advertising and the more you can put into your production. So um, it's really hard. Uh, I've been traveling nonstop since January 15th and it's now, uh, you know, middle of May. I've probably been to 49 or 50 different cities. I have a little bit of help, uh, but not a lot. And we've cleared or gotten picked up in about 45 markets. We'll probably be in 50, 55 when it's all said and done. Most of the major markets, probably 60% of the country. We don't have a sponsor yet. I made my first presentations to advertisers last week. The response was good. Um, so I'm sure we'll get them. Uh, but the reality is you have to have deep pockets in order to finance the Who's show after it? prior to money. Yeah, because the mo- even if I sold the advertising to start in October – by the time the advertising runs and build and then they pay, it's going to be 2014 before any money comes in, you know, best case scenario, probably further mid-2014. No, so how are you, you got to be able to produce shows to continue and stay in business until then, you know. Yeah, that's amazing, the complexity of putting not only a show together. I mean, that, that's right. difficult in itself, and I commend right. you for the quality, if you guys obviously right. have seen the clip. The quality is just, it's production high-end value. It's very well done. Um, from the camera quality to the, um, the editing and the visual effects and that type of stuff. But then what, what's great about you is that you do have some experience in the advertising um, and knowing how to go about it and, and knowing who to approach. Uh, right. So uh, can you give us a little bit of background from where, you're, where you got that experience from? Well, you know, I started off, that was my, I've been doing ad sales my entire adult life. So I started off like in a, a newspaper for retirees. <laughs> so I was like 22 years old and I'm selling, you know, uh, ads to people who have cemetery plots and funeral homes and, and uh, you know, attorneys for, you know, nursing homes and attorneys for estate planning. So that was not very fulfilling for a 22-year-old guy. All I really wanted ever to do was sell for the rock and roll radio station in my hometown, Nashville, Tennessee. And um, they always hung up on me. The guy was a jerk and he never, he's like, ah, you're not, we don't hire people like you. But I'm glad I went through that because I did finally get a job at a radio station at the Light FM. (laughs) So I'm selling like elevator music, you know, I'm like, how can, I'm a young guy, I want to sell rock and roll music and I'm selling Light FM. But That experience made me a really good salesperson because neither one of those things was easy. Those were really hard things to sell. When I made the jump over to TV, that was a piece of cake compared to what I've been doing. And I I was the number one salesperson in that company, I believe, for new business at 25, 26 years of age. My first year in the business, outselling people who'd been doing it for 30 years. And um, ended up. Uh, well, the, 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 the fact that I had to hustle and I knew I could, if you can sell radio, then you can sell TV. That's the thing. It's so much easier uh, to sell television because television is a more powerful medium. And But then, you know, every step along the way, there's somebody standing in your way saying, no, you can't do this. And that has led me up to this moment because when I tried to go from radio to TV, it was like, nah, you haven't done TV then when I was selling TV in Nashville and I tried to go to New York and they're like, you're not from New York. And I was like, yeah, but I'm great in Nashville. And they're like, yeah, but blah, blah, blah. That's how I ended up at Univision. Um, and I still had to scratch and claw to get into that company. And then after three years there, I was like leading that company in new business. And so then, uh, you know, I was trying to make the stretch into national television. And they're like, no, but you're local, so you can't do national. And so now I had my own show on the air. And guess what? I was doing national. And guess what? It was easier. 
And the thing is, like, there's people in your way and they tell you how hard it is. In reality, my experience has always been the higher you go, the easier it gets. Now, there's nothing harder than doing it yourself because you're taking all the risk. You stay awake at night. You're financially uh, liable and the amount of work is insane. But just from going from a local ad sales to a national ad sales. So the, the result of that is when someone tells me no or I, someone told me my show was no good last week. Uh, and it happens. Most of, yeah, most of the time it's people telling me good stuff. But, you know, and I appreciate people's honesty. So uh, you, you learn to listen but not listen. You know what I'm saying? You take it with a grain of salt and you keep going because the reality is nobody knows anything. And the negative of that is I sometimes don't respect people. Um, and and I, I've worked on that the past few years because – I was at a point in my life for a while. I was like, if you hadn't been an entrepreneur, then I can't talk to you because you don't know my experience. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what it's like to have a larger company like Univision work really hard to try to put you out of business or to do business with heavyweights like Fox and ABC and them just sort of stamp on you like a bug, not because they're trying to put you out of business, because they're so big and you're so small, they just don't care about you. So... It's really hard, and, you know, but somehow you have to like work with them and, and get them to care. And it's a difficult dance, man. And so I worked on that when I took some time off after I sold the, um, my other company, my Latin television. And the whole idea with Raw Travel was to be a more positive experience. So what I do now, when I go to stations, I don't bang on the desk like I used to. I don't demand that they put Latinos on TV, which I used to do. I felt like that was my mission. I don't demand that they put the raw travel on because now I'm on the camera and I'm emotionally, personally invested. If somebody says it's no good, I got to say, okay, this show is not for you. That's okay. I'm going to, you know, I'll go across the street. So what I do is I focus on the people who, who give me the positive energy, try not to focus on the negative, And somehow that seems to be working a lot better for me, and I hope I can keep it up, man. It's just getting older, I guess. You know, one of the few benefits of getting older. Okay, so um, you're you're out there, you're you're going crazy, uh, trying to get these things up and running and these shows. Um, I'm curious. Out of the ones that are saying yes, are you catching a pattern or some type of similarity into who they are, what kind of markets they want to cater to? Uh, the appeal, like what is the part that's interesting them to say yes? Well, you know, I, I, having done this once before, um, I know people now and they know who I am, at least in television syndication. And I got to tell you, I love them. They're my friends. You know, they're good, good people. Um, and I love working with them. So they've supported me a lot. So that is a good thing. But I don't think they give that support without there being something there to back it up. I think what they do is they maybe give me the benefit of the doubt and say, this guy's done it before. I'm sure he can do it again. I know this guy. He does what he says. He doesn't lie. He doesn't uh, overpromise and deliver. But the most fulfilling thing um, for a show like ours right now is, from an emotional point of view, is if someone I've never met I've never talked to before, and I go in with the show cold. They don't know who I am. They never heard of me. They don't care about what I used to do, and they respond to the show, and they love it. And what I found, Carlos, is that it's about 50-50 of people who get it and people who don't. Some people just don't get it. They're like, it's, you know, whatever. They're like, I don't understand why you don't, what? And they just don't like travel. But the other 50%, for whatever reason, completely 100% get it. And, you know, we've gotten some excellent time periods. We're coming out of news after CBS on Sunday nights on the CBS affiliate in Portland, Oregon, coming out of the late news. Um, We're in Oklahoma City on the NBC affiliate at 6.30 on a Saturday afternoon coming out of their news. I mean, there's so many good times. We're in New York City at Saturday at midnight. That may not sound like a lot, but in New York City... That's tough, dude. That's the hardest station yeah. to clear. And we're not on in L.A. It's kicking my butt. I live in L.A. and it doesn't make sense. You know, it doesn't make sense. And, and we're not on in your hometown, Atlanta. LA. What's that? There's a big Latin market in L.A. I'm surprised. Well, you know, but the show isn't Latin per se. And I tried not That's to true. pitch it that way. Right. Um, it is um, going to attract a Latin audience. 
Uh, but, you know, most of the general market stations, which is what we're going on, they still don't prioritize the Latin market. You know, it's still, um, it's still, you know, because one a, a, a thing when you're such a Latin market, everything's more Latino. Like they have more Latin news anchors on air, things like that. So, you, you know, the whole television station should be Latino influenced, you know. Right. L.A. is a very, um, I think, even more important than just being a Latin market. It's a very multicultural market. There's a lot of Asians here. Obviously, you know, African-Americans, but there's a, it's almost as diverse as New York. It's just segregated and bigger and spread out. Mm. But the show would do incredible here. It will do incredible. We will get picked up eventually. Um, but, you know, it's it's that just goes to show you, uh, you know, L.A., we are not picked up yet. And yet in many markets, I had three or four stations competing for the show. And I was put mm. in a situation where I had to make some people mad. And uh, I don't like that. Um, I don't like it. I want to. I want everybody who wants the show to have the show, and I want everybody to want the show. <laughs> That's what I want. Right, and of course, you're not going to say, "Well, you know, here I am going to the city. I'm only going to focus on one." Because if they say no, then you're out of luck. So you have to throw it at everybody or as many people right. as you can. Right. And then if they all want it, it's uh, a great bad problem to have. But uh, and I've had it. I've had it more with this show than ever. I've never had this problem before. Um, if I go to a market and I show the show, chances are there's going to be more than one station interested in it. Not always, uh, but I'm about 80% at getting a market when I personally go. You've been producing the show. You've been uh, Now you have a company or somebody editing this, right? Well, my, my company edits it. I have people that work for me, uh, freelancers. And uh, so we have an editor in uh, New York. Our editor, cameraman's in New York. And then I have an editor, uh, director, cameraman in Bogota. And so um, it's a real lean. And then I have, you know, animators, other part-time people as well. Uh, but essentially what we're going to do is great, but, you know, it can be done, but it is difficult. So we're all going to gather together in Mexico City and start shooting, and basically we're uh, starting in Mexico City, working our way down by bus all the way to Panama City over an eight-week period, shooting eight more episodes. And we've already got nine in the can, so that'll get us to 17, and then when we come back, we're going to shoot five in the U.S. And um, our, our offices will be more centrally located because I'm planning on moving to New York. So we'll, we'll try, to, try to get, you know... Similar to what I did before, you start really small. You never really want to overspend too much at the beginning. You want to try to keep your cost as low as possible because until money starts coming in and no money's coming in, it's only going one direction right now, out. Yeah. And it's it's the worst time. It's fun because you're building something, but it's horrible because there's no money coming in. It's only going one direction. So, you know, the key to success is to make sure that you don't run out of money before you run out of project or before – you can turn that corner. So the longer you can hold on to your money, it's time is money has never been more uh, appropriate, you know, but it's not like time is money. You got to get stuff done now. I mean, that's always true, but it's more like time is money is like the more money you have and the less you can spend it, the less your burn rate, the more time you have to make this a success. And we're confident it's going to work, but we're pretty well financed. So I, I feel good about it. That's great. Um, now, I'm going to touch on one more thing, and then we're going to want to finish off with, you know, with the future of, of the show. Um, sure. Equipment. Right. Now, you've, you've traveled with your equipment, and you mentioned that some places you don't want to go with these big cameras and stuff. Can you kind of throw in a little bit about what kind of equipment you're using and, and any difficulties you've had? I know one time you had mentioned uh, in our conversations is um, that you guys were robbed or attacked or something right. because of the equipment. Uh, just right. touch upon that, and then, and then that's it. Yeah, I mean, well, when the three of us are together, we usually are, are pretty cool. Um, you know, knock on some wood here, because we got to go through some some sort of sketchy areas in Guatemala and Mexico. But, um, yeah, what, I, what we shoot on is, um, let's see if I got them here. Well, I've got this one right here. This is a Canon 7D, or D7, I don't know which, I don't know, I always, it's a 7D. And so this is beautiful uh, because it's obviously an SLR camera, shoots great stills, but it also shoots beautiful B-roll, and it's great for B-roll. Now, for audio, it's not that great because, well, it can be, but you have to record it separately to have real professional audio. 
And the problem is when you're traveling like we are eight weeks at a time, the last thing you need are more files that can be corrupted, more equipment to carry. So typically, we're just using this for B-roll. That's how we've historically done it. We're planning right now for our travels for the future, so we're, we're having a conference call on Sunday because I had to buy a new camera, I think. The other camera that we used, and I'm just going to reach back here, it happens to be here, is this uh, Sony. And this is a straight-to-tape HD camera. I probably retails, uh, I probably paid 3500 for it like five years ago. Mm. But basically, it's straight-to-tape. The color doesn't pop like it does in the 7D. However, it has uh, XLR inputs for the audio, and uh, basically, you get really clean professional audio with it. And it's not very big. It's pretty light. So, you know, we have this, the tr that camera, the tripod. We're going to pick up a, a GoPro um, camera so I can do a little POV kind of shots this time around. Uh, but we're probably going to trade that camera in and upgrade because the uh, video doesn't match the video, it's not as vivid of colors, and you have to color correct a lot to get it up to the standard of 7D. Plus, it shoots to tape, and we're traveling for so long. We don't want to be carrying a bunch of tape with us that could get lost. Right. Uh, we would rather shoot to uh, memory sticks and then back up those memory sticks. So this is a important thing because I don't know. I mean, I'm sure movies have done it and other television shows, but travel shows producing 22 episodes, shooting eight weeks at a time, eight episodes – and not going back to home base, um, I'm not sure that that's ever happened and that I'm aware of. And so we're still figuring out how we're going to do it, backing up, making redundant backups. How do we get the footage back to New York? God forbid if we get robbed. Um, we never got robbed. I have been robbed personally, but that was just like a fake taxi in Argentina. But the little, but the 7D, I was out shooting it uh, one night before my, the other crew members got to, uh, into town in Quito before we were going to shoot in Ecuador and these four, and, uh, for some reason, the little guy came in and tried to get the camera and I had it around my neck and having been robbed and knowing that we had a shoot coming up and I just, I, you know, I wasn't in the mood to get robbed, man. I don't know. And I was just like, <laughs> we're from New York. We can't, get yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, nah, you got to have to like all four of you going to have to take this camera, not just one. So I just started screaming and yelling and fighting the guy off. And um, he, he, after about 45 seconds, he gave up and they walked off. And, you know, it, they just were looking for an easy mark. And the fact that I had it out at night, it wasn't a terrible neighborhood. It actually was in a tourist zone. But I found out later that's the worst place to be. And that gets back to your first point at the first part of the show about going to dangerous areas. Yeah. When you go to dangerous areas, you don't take equipment like that because you know going in, you don't want to take any valuables. The times that I've, I have gotten in trouble, and I've been either robbed or attempted robbery three times, was when I had a false sense of security. When I had been in a location for maybe a couple of months or a couple of months, and was like, everything's cool, this place is fine, I'm not going to get robbed, I'm going to take my camera out, I'm going to be a little, and I got careless. Yeah. And that's when I got punished. When you're going to a place that you know is sketchy, you're on high alert, and I've never had a problem. So it's a, it's weird how that works. It is, um, and it's funny. Um, you've been lately traveling a lot in the United States, so I'm sure you know where to avoid and that type of thing. But okay, so you 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 had you had the equipment. Um, we've got we've gotten into how you had to approach uh, the different networks and different syndicates, right. um, and you have a certain number of episodes. If you told us already, uh, episodes put together. Now what? What's next? Yeah, well, I mean, getting it on the air, uh, which is no small task, because just producing it, <laughs> believe it or not, is you're still not there. Producing it, you got to distribute it, which we're doing. You have contracts with each of these stations, which you have to fill out. Then you have to physically feed the show by satellite to get it to them. And then you've got to sell sponsors and advertisers and get their commercials in, do contracts with them. Uh, so, you know, we launch on October the 5th, the first weekend of October in the United States. And we have an international distributor that's going to be selling it in other countries. So, and, and that's a different format. That, one, that show is 24 minutes long where the show in the U.S. is 21 and a half minutes long because of commercials. Mm. So now I've got an FTP, the show, to this company in Denmark called Off the Fence that's going to be distributing, representing us. There is so much work to do that if I think about it or if I make a list of it, I'll freak out and get paralyzed. I won't even get out of bed. So what I do, what I don't do is I sort of don't do think about it. I think about it in bite-sized pieces. What do I have to do today? And if I have a spare moment, try to like, what can I be doing right now? 
And the unfortunate side effect of all of this of handling it by yourself, which, by the way, hopefully is a temporary thing, as it was with my Latin shows, is that you are not able to creatively be in that free zone where you really need to be, man. You really need to be relaxed, yeah. not completely stressed out all the time. Because I can't just come home and start writing a script at 7 o'clock at night. I'm burnt. I'm fried. Yeah. So I know. I have to start writing at 6 a.m. if I wake up. I'll do the non-creative task later on in the day, uh, the, the sort of grunt work, I call it. Uh, but there's just a lot of grunt work to be done. Uh, but, you know, eventually what we want with the show is obviously to be successful via syndication. We would like to, uh, hopefully, if we're lucky, um, you know, maybe do a second run cable so that you'll be able to see it on cable after it's aired and broadcast. Um, and if you're in watching from another country, hopefully in 2014, uh, you'll see the show uh, internationally. And then eventually Netflix, Amazon, you know, Roku, all that stuff. It, it'll, you know, we're, we're basically going through the process. And if the show works in one window, it'll keep working in others. And it grows. It grows organically. And hopefully this interview, we can all look back on it and be like, ah, I remember when, you know, or or not. And if not, then. Or we'll be like, oh, Carlos, let's show it on that your guy? website. <laughs> what? We'll be like, hey, Carlos, when are we going to show it on your channel? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or be like, hey, Carlos, whatever happened to that guy who had all those big plans? It's like, oh, he, hey, uh, he you passed know, out. <laughs> I, I mean, I've known Rob for a long time. Um, right. it's, been, it's been a long time. And I've seen yeah. you. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen you fail. Uh, I mean, right. I'm sure there's been some minor failures, but uh, the fact that y you have the knowledge and the fact that uh, everything looks good, um, you know, on top of that, you're a good-looking guy. So it's not like you're you're some <laughs> chunky dude. And even the chunky dudes. I mean, if you watch the Food Network, they're making it well on on TV as well. So <laughs> it's a good time to be a chunky dude, man. Uh <laughs> <laughs> so, I may be a chunky dude after all this is said and done because this is going to be rough. Uh, but yeah, I, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Uh, but just so you know, there, I, I I don't always look at it that way. I sort of you you it's that's what's funny about doing it a second or a third time. I'm no more confident than I was. You know, I still have the same fears. I still wake up with that same cold sweat, and I have to tell myself exactly what you just told me to get through the day. And I would say out of seven days, four of them are full of doubt. But it's those three that you're like, I see the vision. And you see it so clearly and you're so confident. And they're so powerful that it makes up for those four days that you're doubtful. And as time goes on, those four days become three, two, to eventually it's one day out of 14 because you know what you're doing. You're confident. And, um, you know, if I can do it again, which I think we can, I will hopefully feel like at that point not invincible because it's not you're not but at least I sort of can feel like hey I've been through this I know where I'm going through and I just got to keep going and, and maybe I can help others that's really what I want to do you know well, that's very cool um, I've, I've enjoyed everything all the clips they've been sending me and um, I really appreciate you coming on to my show and what we wanted to do originally, is, and we can probably still continue to do it, is uh, follow the trials and tribulations and having another conversation again and, yeah. and giving people idea and, and, an idea of, hey, if you're trying to put together a show, um, this is a certain, it's not a perfect path, uh, but, but there is a way. There's yeah. a way, and if you're committed and if, if you, you can overcome those fears, then, then th there's a possibility of everything kind of working out for, for everyone. Um, but we are in a world that's changing. We're in a world where content is everywhere, online, on your phone. And, you know, the lounge itself is, is proof of that. Um, but, uh, you know, I wish you so much luck. And, nice. and thank you again. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, Robert Rose, um, where can people find you? Well, I would, uh, you can log on to the show website, rawtravel.tv. It is getting relaunched before the show uh, premieres in October. Uh, but, you know, you can see the trailer and then uh, you can find out more about me and my business at amtvgroup.com. Uh, but, you know, my suggestion is please follow us, facebook.com slash raw travel TV and twitter.com or our handle is raw travel TV at Twitter. So that's where you're going to get the most immediate stuff, especially when we're traveling on the road in uh, Latin America. And I hope we can check in with you maybe from Guatemala somewhere when we got a good web connection. 
we'll try to like hook up with you and let you know how it's going. You know, yeah, and I'd love to do that because um, hopefully it'll build an anticipation. Uh, hopefully, when the first uh, few episodes start to launch and you start creating a fan base. And they'll start hitting you on the website and they'll start following the social networks. Uh, they might want to take a peek at what you're doing before the show ever gets edited and so on. So it'd be great to be able to put those things together with you. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and thank you for the support, Carlos. Really appreciate it. And anything we can do to help you guys out at the Lounge Network, we'll do it. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Well, that ends our show. Thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, there's always more episodes coming soon. So keep on watching and thank you for your support. Part of the fun of traveling is sharing photos and videos of your trip upon your return, or even while you're traveling in blogs and social media sites. Here are a few tips to help you document your trip. First, consider your destination and your goals. Now, a camera like this is great for high quality photos and videos, but it's expensive, it can be a little bulky to carry, and it may make you stand out in places you'd rather blend in. A smaller camera like this one is more discreet. I chose this one because it's rugged and it shoots underwater. It also shoots video. Now speaking of video, for video on the go, I really like this little flip cam. Now this flip cam is small and subtle, yet it still shoots high definition video. Just beware, you need to hold it really steady and it works best in lots of light. Regardless of the gear you choose, you're going to want to protect it. So pack some sandwich bags like this to protect it from the elements like sand, water and dust. For more tips like these, log on to rawtravel.tv and click on tips.